I'm not a huge fan of being caught off guard like that. Um, it's not, not my thing. Um, we ready to get in the Word today? I, I mean, that's, that's why we're here, right? We, we come to worship, to fellowship, but to get in the Word. And uh, I'm excited about today's message. I, I've been preparing this series that we've been on, Confronting Christianity, and I've been talking about things that we, the questions we have, things that come up that whether you're saved or unsaved, believe or not believe, we all have questions about the church, about Christianity, about these things that I wanted to confront this month. I wanted to look at these things and say, okay, these are legitimate questions that people have, and let's answer them. Let's talk about them. Let's have a discussion about them. So I want to, I want to preface the question, because I'll share that with you later, but I want to say this. When it comes to faith, there are a variety of thoughts, okay? There are a variety of thoughts, mainly because it's something uh, that is difficult to not just understand, but to practice, right? Faith is hard. Would you say that? Would, it, would you agree with that? Faith is, faith is difficult. But the simple fact is we all practice faith every day of our lives. Simple faith is a daily practice by every person in this room. It, it's simple. Now, I need a volunteer. Um, who wants to volunteer? I can pull somebody out if I need to. You want to... He just, she's like, come, she's like jumping up and down. Come on. Hey, Brett, stick around next service and I'll get you there. All right. So um, climb the ladder. Just, just climb as high as you, high as you want to go. Be careful because the top's a little janky, but um, <laughs> as high as you want to go. Yeah. No higher? Okay. So, so what just happened in front of you? Stay there for a little while. You, you comfortable? You good? Need some water? Okay. Um, so when you, when you think about what's going on right now, what you're seeing is you're seeing somebody that is practicing faith right in front of you. Right in front of your eyes, faith is being practiced. It's being utilized right in front of you. So Terry, meet Terry. Um, Terry decided that she's okay with climbing the ladder. Matter of fact, you saw what she did. She just walked up there, okay, let's go, right up it, okay? Now, what Terry couldn't have known was if the rungs of this ladder were actually bolted in. She couldn't have known that, right? I didn't tell her. I pulled her up out of the audience. But still, she climbed the ladder in faith that they were solid and that she wouldn't fall. We do this every day. We do this kind of thing every day of our lives. We get out of bed in the morning, put our feet on the floor, we get dressed, we do our thing, go to work, go to church, whatever it may be, all in good faith that the floor is not going to fall in, that the car is going to start, that the front door is going to open and I'm going to walk right out of it, that I'm not going to have an accident on the way to work. You're all utilizing faith. If we weren't utilizing faith, we would all be basket cases and lay in the bed. Actually, we wouldn't because we wouldn't believe that the bed would hold us. So we would all just be crazy if we didn't have faith in our lives. Thank you. Give it up for us. Your faith, my faith, gave you the motive for action. Faith is what gives you the motive for action. For her to come over here and do that, she had a motive that it's going to be okay. All right? I, I'm looking at the ladder right now, and I know that it's going to be okay, so I'm going to step into action to climb it because I know it's going to be there. So her faith actually gave her the motive for action. Now turn with me in Matthew chapter 13 if you have your Bibles. Matthew chapter 13. And, uh, and in this portion of scripture, Jesus begins talking about the kingdom of heaven. Okay, he's talking about the kingdom and said something that was a little bit different than what people expected for him to say. He told them another parable. This is, all right, ch chapter uh, 13, verse 31 and 32 is where we're at. If you don't have your Bibles, it'll be on, your, on the screen behind me. But this is what it says. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven... Is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree, 
so that the birds come and perch in its branches. Okay, you know, Jesus is telling another one of his stories, you know, he's kind of putting together all the, 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 you know, horticulture it looks like. He's a big horticulturist. As Jesus tells the parable and teachings of various kinds throughout the book of Matthew, in chapter 17, he comes back to this idea. Now, there was something special about this mustard seed idea because, you know, in chapter 13, you see him talk about the mustard seed. He, he mentions it. A mustard seed is the smallest of all seeds, but yet it produces the largest of gardens. Then, four chapters later, he comes back to this idea of the mustard seed. This is what he says in verse 20, chapter 17, verse 20 and 21. He replied, Because you have so little faith, truly I tell you, if you have the faith as small as a mustard seed, he says it again, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. The phrase that he uses here, as small as a mustard seed, was a common expression in Jesus' day. All right, so this is another one of those times where he's using the cultural references so that people could understand what he's saying. It had become a proverbial saying used frequently by rabbis, especially, that indicated the smallest amount. So when a rabbi would talk, he would often use the phrase, as small as a mustard seed, in reference to, it's a very small amount, very small. Now we see Jesus, who is also a rabbi, Speaking the same way. It was a cultural understanding of what he was saying. And if you read through scripture and you see the words of Jesus, you see a lot of times he talks in cultural references. And we do too. When we look at it and go, well, that was weird. We, we talk the same way. We talk in cultural references too. We're just not in the same culture he was. Jesus is telling his disciples that they don't need an abundance of faith, just a little bit, and that little bit can do great things. That, that's what he's saying. So the emphasis is on quality of faith, not the quantity of faith. That's what Jesus is talking about here. He's saying the quality of your faith is small as a mustard seed. You can tell a mountain to move, and it'll move. So he's talking about the quality of the faith you use. Even if you're here today and you don't have a ton of faith in your life because of whatever circumstances is going on, but you can muster out, (laughs) like how I did that? You can muster out a small quantity, then that small quantity will have enough quality to move a mountain. Jesus is serious right here. He's talking some some deep things. So the question for today that many believers and non-believers have asked and wondered, and I've been in this boat, every question I've talked about in this series, I've asked the same one, I promise you. But this is what it is. Isn't faith just irrational or emotive or and emotive? Meaning, isn't, just, isn't faith just irrational and full of emotions? That's the question. Because a lot of people wonder if the Christian faith is just about emotions. You come here and you get Holy Spirit goosebumps because your, arms, your hair stands up on your arms when there's a song that you really like come on. You know, and you're like, oh, I like this song. And you hear angels sing. But then a song that comes on you don't like, all of a sudden Satan entered the room, you know, and and it's gone. So is it just emotional? The Oxford Dictionary, Oxford English Dictionary, well, I'm going to tell you this. The Oxford English Dictionary, if you're wondering, is uh, is the authority of all dictionaries in a lot of people's minds, especially theologians, especially philosophers, uh, Bible teachers, uh, regular teachers, The Oxford English Dictionary has some authority in it. It defines faith as a belief based on evidence, testimony, or authority. Now, when I look at that, that is a little different than the way we think about when it comes to church. When we think about faith, faith is saying, I have faith, and you know, it's faith is that which is unseen, and I believe that it can happen. I'll speak something that's not as if it was. And and, and you know what? Those are great. Thoughts, but are they completely accurate when it comes to the idea of faith? Stay with me because I'm going to explain. In other words, faith isn't the opposite of evidence and testimony. Faith is reasoned. It's based on good evidence. That's what faith is. Think about this. When you trust something or someone, when you trust something, right? 
Not every aspect of your trust is proven. Terry didn't come up and say, okay, well, I'm going to examine this. I'm going to make sure that it's solid. Terry, I don't know if I would have climbed this ladder if I were you. Uh, so I'm gonna, but I'm going to look at it, and I'm going to make sure that all the bolts are there. She didn't do that. She just walked behind it, and she said, okay, I have faith. It's going to work, right? She didn't, she didn't examine the whole thing. So when you trust someone, not every aspect is proven. You might have good reasons to trust someone, and that's enough to put your faith in them. We are exercising faith every time we walk into a doctor's office or have surgery. Anybody ever had surgery before? I had surgery in 2019. That was my last one. And I met this guy one time. He told me the problem. I knew his credentials. I did some research on him and found out that he was the best in our area of doing this surgery. I walk in there, I get, I get an IV, I go to sleep, and I give him permission to cut a hole in my neck. <laughs> but that's surgery, though. That's what we do, right? If you've got to have an operation, you're trusting the doctor that he knows what he's doing based on evidence. He has done this before. How many times? I remember when my first daughter was born. I asked the doctor, how many times have you done this? Because I've never done it. And if you're, right, if you're in the same boat as me, you're not doing it either, you know? He looked at me and he goes, over 2,000 times. I said, let's go. Better you than me, you know? What we're doing is trusting that they are an authority and that they have the right documentation that says that, they're in a, that they have that authority. Think, I think Christianity has got a great deal of evidence to support it, biblical and philosophical. Not proof, but enough evidence for someone to express trust in this whole Christianity thing as a reasonable way of understanding the world. In other words, creating a worldview based on biblical evidence. We have that. When Jesus said to have faith of a mustard seed, when he says these words, it's not by accident that he pointed out to the smallest seed in the world. It's not by accident. He did it on purpose. The smallest amount of faith in a big God can produce great results in our life. The smallest seed produces the biggest crops. I think that was a huge thing that he said. We have a huge God. We are tiny, and we are insignificant in a lot of ways compared to God. But God sees us and says, hey, if you'll just have a little bit of faith in a big God like me, I can do things that you can never imagine. Amen? Amen. I want to go back to the question. I'm really dig into that for a minute. Isn't faith just irrational? And emotive. Most of us have developed a love-hate relationship with emotions. Would you, would you agree with that? There is a recognition that, at least in part, that emotions are central to what it means to live life or to be human and experience reality. If you're a robot, you're not going to have emotions, right? We live our life through emotions. Complaining, we talked about that last week, comes from emotions, right? Anger, resentment, happiness, sadness, all emotions. They're all emotions that we all live with every day. The fascinating part, or the fascinating thing, is that who we love, what angers us, what moves us, what bores us to tears... All of this defines us. It gives us character and constitutes who we are. Think about God. God created us in his image, in his image and in his likeness. If God did that, then God is probably an emotional God too. He has these things. He's emotional. You see where he, Jesus rides in Jerusalem and weeps over the people of Jerusalem. He weeps over them. That's an emotional response to something. Think about the last conversation you had with someone. I will bet much of it or all of it was focused on emotions. Right? Yes? Or are you all robots? So, how are you? 
That's, a, that's an emotional question. How are you? Then we share what makes us upset, what makes us happy, what saddens us. We share these things. These are emotionals. But emotions can also be problematic. Amen? They impact our lives in ways that we cannot control. From an early age, society has taught us that emotions are irrational. Emotions are childish. Emotions are a sign of weakness, especially in guys. Emotions can interfere with getting what you really want. Emotions are not always reliable. This is what society has taught us. With all these things in mind, so to say faith requires no emotion would be false. You can't say it. But to say faith is only emotional is also false. There's a problem here. (laughs) They're both false. Emotions reinforce the reasonable truths of Scripture and theology by making them personal, which touches our emotions. In other words, we need emotions. We need them. They are a good partner for faith. But we can't rely on only emotions to prove we have faith. We can't. If we did that, we would all be in trouble when it comes to the receiving from God. Because God's timeline is not our timeline. When we get emotional, he doesn't get emotional and give us what we want. He knows already what's best for us. And he knows when he's going to do things. If we allow emotions to get in the way, we would give up on God because he's not doing it in our timing. And that becomes a problem. John Wesley once said, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ. Christ alone for salvation. Salvation can be a very emotional thing for a lot of people. I know some people that just say, when I was a kid... I gave my life to Jesus at some point, and I just knew that it was what I was supposed to do. I've always been in the Word. I've always prayed, and I just lived my life. It wasn't very emotional for them at that time of salvation. And I think about me in my own experience, how my steering wheel became my altar on the side of a road. I wept like a baby. God's Spirit just came down in my car and wrecked me that night. I remember that happening. That was a very emotional experience for me. But I didn't ride those emotions 25, 30 years later. I didn't ride on those emotions. I remember that. It's a fond memory. But if I just had a memory of it and I didn't have a relationship today that stemmed from that, then all that is is an emotional experience that did me no good. C.S. Lewis, one of the best theological writers, I think, to ever live. He described faith as a virtue, not opposed to reason, but to imagination and emotion. Think about anesthetics of surgery. When you have surgery, you get put to sleep. If you don't get put to sleep in surgery, (laughs) good for you. I'm like, put me down. Put me down fast. My reason is perfectly convinced by good idea that anesthetics do not smother me and that perfectly trained surgeons will not start operating until I am unconscious. Right? But my imagination and my emotions soon push back against what reason tells me. But that doesn't change the fact that when they have me down on the table and put that horrible mask on my face, a childish panic begins inside of me. You ever been there before? I mean, it's like, and they're like, take deep breaths. And I'm like, I'm just trying to live right now. In other words, I lose my faith in anesthetics. Because I allow my emotions to come out. When my emotions come out, I lose my faith. One of the, you've you've heard this story a hundred times. I'm not going to stay on it long, but for 18 years, you you guys know I've been praying for my wife to receive healing. I get emotional about it sometimes. She gets emotional about it. God, where are you in this? If I allowed those emotions to be all there is to it. I would give up completely having hope that God can do it. 
every time. That's what we would do. You have a loved one that is lost, that don't know Christ. You've been praying for them. You've been praying for them, and they're not saved yet. They're not at that place yet where they've come to, to come to the understanding of Jesus Christ as their Savior. And you still, and you pray, and you pray, and you pray, and nothing's happening. If you allow your emotions to take over, it's okay. I mean, I was just talking to somebody before service. If you look at Jeremiah, the prophet, he was known as the weeping prophet. Because he wept over the people of Israel. He literally wept over them. That was emotional. But it wasn't an emotion that he rode. It was an emotion that he felt because he still had faith and trust in God that God could save those people. It came out in that, but it didn't take over that. If I lose my faith in something because of emotions... It's really hard for me to get that back. It's really hard for me to go back to that place. It's not reason that is taking away my faith. My faith is based on reason. It's faith is based on it. The battle between faith and reason on one side and emotion and imagination on the other side. I have faith in a surgeon, but I imagine with emotions that I will die. Right? I'm saying good, I'm having a minor surgery and I'm saying goodbye to my family because I feel like I'm going to die as soon as they put me to sleep. Because the anesthesiologist is going to sneeze and push too much in there and there I go, I'm out. I'm visiting Jesus, you know. C.S. Lewis writes, faith is the art of holding on to things your reason has once accepted in spite of your changing moods. In spite of your changing moods. In other words, in spite of you or in spite of me. Second side to the question is the rational side. Talked about the emotional side. The rational side. Is faith rational? Is it a rational thing? Is it irrational? Which one is it? To many, belief in God, a God that we cannot see, have not seen, is irrational, right? I mean, you talk to lost people, you talk to people in the world that that don't believe in God, that kind of stuff. It's irrational to believe in a God that we can't see. The claim is because of a lack of evidence, which is only said on the basis of an interference, okay? Stay with me. What does this mean? Believers know that through creation, we know there's a God. If you've seen a childbirth, you know there's a God. All right? Faith is not a suspension of critical thinking, but rather an understanding that even when things can't be explained or reasoned, you have a relationship with a being, a heavenly father that impedes all creation and has dominion over all things. He is the creator and the speaker of of life. We know this because it's our faith. It's what our faith is based on. It's irrational to think that something exists that we've never seen. However, if you've ever been to, if you've never been to Antarctica, how can you say that it exists? Right? Have you ever been to Antarctica? No? Well, how do we know it exists? Because somebody said it did. On good faith from the evidence has been proven. Th- uh, let's go, okay, let's, let's, let's get a little not silly with that. Is God the healer? Okay. That's faith that he is? Are you, having, are, are you speaking in faith when you say yes? Are you speaking out of faith? What are you speaking out of? Have you ever been healed before? Okay. So some of you have been healed. Some of you maybe have, haven't experienced that. Your faith is greater than those who have it because you've experienced it, right? Let's talk. It's okay. People online will understand. So, if I've been to Antarctica, I'll get back to healing in a minute, I promise you. Then I know it's real by my word and my authority. Remember what what Oxford Dictionary said? You have a right to believe me based on authority or evidence, as the dictionary puts it. 
So faith is actually a reasonable and rational thing, both. In fact, it's something that we can't live without. If I tell you God is the healer, and you've never experienced that, you have every right in the world to doubt what I'm saying because you haven't experienced it, and that's okay. But what you have to look back on and go, okay, do you believe that the Bible is the infallible word of God? All scriptures God breathed, useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and righteous, right? I mean, it's there. So if you believe this, Based on evidence, you're, you're basing it on the evidence of the word and based on a lot of times what you've been brought up to believe. But something like healing, I'm just using it as an example, something like healing, do you believe it based on what? Something you've experienced or something you've heard about? Here's the way I'm going to wrap this healing part up. In 2019, I was miraculously healed. My body was healed. I know it. I know it. I know it. If you knew me then and you knew what, I was, what was going on in my body, you've seen a difference and you know exactly what I'm talking about. God brought, a, brought part of my spine back to life. I'm telling you this from experience. I'm telling you this based on authority because I have been through it. I've experienced it. I have doctor's notes. I have a doctor that told me I was a miracle that I should not even be walking right now. But, and he said, God, our, our things that are dead does not come back to life. And I had something dead in my, th- in my spine and now it's alive. Okay. Now I'm telling you that not based on theory. I'm telling you that based on experience and evidence and authority. I have the authority to tell you that because I've experienced it. Now, according to the dictionary, it is now up to you whether you believe in healing or not because now you've heard it from authority that it's true. Do you understand? Are you with me? So what I should have just done just now is boosted your faith a little bit that it can happen, that things supernatural can take place. I want to go back to the words of Jesus after I show you something the Apostle Paul said. So Apostle Paul, if you know who that is, he wrote a lot of the New Testament, and he often referred back to the words of Christ. This is what he said in Romans 12, 3. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. Now this is interesting because some versions say the measure of faith you've been given. Okay, let's put all this together. Because I know you guys are ready to canvas those neighborhoods. Yes. Yes. So Jesus said a mustard seed of faith will move mountains. Or do big things in the spiritual realm. If Jesus mentions a small amount of faith does big things and God has given to each of us a measure of faith, do we not think that the measure of faith that God has given us is enough to move the mountains that Jesus was referring to? So the faith is already inside of you what you need to speak things into existence. Now I'm not talking about God, I need a million dollars. Poof, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, but that would be great. Make sure you tithe. No. But what I'm saying is, the faith that you need is already there. God has already placed it inside. It takes faith for salvation to take place. It takes faith for healing. It takes faith for certain things to take place in our life. It takes faith for the simplest thing like climbing a ladder. It takes faith and that small amount of faith that Jesus said you need is already inside of us because God has already given us a measure of it. It's already inside of us. When Jesus challenges us to exercise the faith, he's challenging us to withdraw the amount of faith that is already inside of us to do big things. Faith doesn't come down to emotions or rationality. It comes down to confidence and trust. That's the root idea of the word. The idea that it's sort of 
blindly accepting things without evidence is a new definition. Did you know the idea of blind faith is totally new? It's only been around for a, for a little while, for, you know, I mean, decades, but I'm saying it's not something that's, that was mentioned here. Blind faith, there's no blind faith. Blind faith didn't come out to the 1800s, that whole idea of the phrase blind faith. There is evidence of God everywhere. Jesus didn't view faith as blind. In fact, he said in 1 John 10, if I do not do the works of my Father, don't believe me. This is what he says. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works themselves so that you may know and understand that the Father is in me. It's not irrational, but a belief on what we've seen and heard. There's no blind faith. So in closing, closing part one, is faith rational? Is faith irrational? We've already stated that faith does have an emotional content because we are emotional beings. But I believe it's time for Christians themselves to go back and re-examine the true foundations of our faith. For example, in Acts 26, Luke records Paul's defense of the Christian faith before uh, Governor Festus. If you've ever read that, um, he he went before Governor Festus and King Agrippa. He went before both of them. And as he was speaking, Festus told Paul that he was out of his mind and that his great learning, because Paul was a very smart man, he trained, he he knew knew scripture, he, he knew all that stuff. It was driving him insane, is basically what they told him. In response, Paul simply says this, I'm not insane, most excellent Festus. I love the, I'm not insane, you're most excellent Festus. It's great. On the contrary, what I am saying is true and reasonable. For the king knows about these matters. Then he brings the king into it. And I also speak to him with confidence, since I am persuaded that none of these things escape his notice. For this has not been done in a corner. It's been done in public. It's been done where everybody can see it. To sum it up, faith is belief in inspiration, revelation, and authority. So the Bible tells us all three. The Bible is all three. The Bible is inspirational. The Bible is revelation, and the Bible is authority. The authority in this room is this right here. That's the authority in this room. Every week we come together, this is the authority. If this is not preached, then there is no authority in this room. Do you understand what I'm saying? This is the ultimate authority. If I ever get up here and preach anything other than this, I have forfeited my authority. Because this is what it's based on. And if it's not in here, I'm not going to preach it. The way you build your faith, if you're struggling with this, is to make the word of God your final authority. That's what you have to do. Feed on it. Meditate on it. Act on it. Pray it into your life. Some of the hardest things we can do. Listen, Christianity is not for the faint of heart. Serving Jesus is not for the faint of heart. It's for those that are saying, you know what? I acknowledge that this is my authority. And if Jesus said, by his stripes, I'm healed, I'm going to believe that. But if he also says, I'm going to use you in the middle of your crisis. So I need you to go through this. You might need to go through this a little while longer, but I'm going to use it because I'm going to glorify myself in what you're dealing with. That is also his authority. And I've got to get to the point where I believe that and I'm okay with that. So this morning, I want to encourage you. Try not to stay emotional in everything you do. Try not to. Especially when it comes to the things of God because his timing is not our timing. And he is so frustrating sometimes, right? Let's, Let's be real. Sometimes God can frustrate us. But is it God frustrating us or is it the emotional side of things that frustrate us? 
Is it really trust and faith that we say, God, I trust you and I have faith in you, but when my emotions come out on it, I'm mad at you because you didn't do this for me. That becomes emotional. So I think there's aspects of it. There's aspects of emotions that we have to have. There's aspects of understanding that that faith is not irrational. It is rational. It is something that we have evidence of. We have evidence. We have proof. We have documentation. We need everything we have. The idea of blind faith means I'm walking into something not knowing anything and just having faith. Real faith is saying there's evidence all around me that God can do it. So I'm going to, at this point, exercise faith in the understanding that I already have. We have to understand faith, understand what it really is, and get this idea out of our heads that we can float because we have faith that we can do so. If there's no, if there's no bridge from here to those seats, I can't make it. I can't. So why would I even try? But you build a bridge, I'll walk right across it because there's evidence there. Heavenly Father, I love you. I love your word. I love your voice in my life. I love the fact that you set us up for success. You didn't set us up to fail. You didn't tell us to just try to develop some sort of something inside of us that gives us faith. No, you said that you've already given it to us. You've given us that measure, God. And I just pray that each one of us can somehow, myself included, because it's so hard sometimes, to muster up, to bring out that small amount of faith that's inside of us. As Jesus said, this faith of a mustard seed that tells a mountain to move and it'll move, God, help us to find that mustard seed inside of us, Lord. I know we all need it. There's things going on in all of our lives where we need you. Help us to not be so riddled with emotions that we can't see. The faith is rational. Lord, I pray for every person here today. God, I pray that you will guide and direct them, Lord, that your presence will be so evident in their life. Lord, they will see how much you love them, how much you care about them, and you care about the little things that that we think are insignificant. Lord, you see those and you care about them. So bless every home, every family structure that's here today. God, I pray for those that are going to be canvassing today. I pray safety over them. I pray protection over them. I pray fun over them, God. Let them have a good time. I pray boldness, God, as they speak to people and they invite people. God, they'll, they'll have opportunities to just share the love of Jesus, to share what you've done in their life, to be that light in a dark world, God. God, in just a moment as we receive giving for today, Lord. I just pray over that as well. I pray blessing over that. That every person here, Lord, will walk daily in the favor of the Lord.